All right. Are we are we on now? I see uh, more attendees are popping up, uh, so we should wait until sort of it fills up. But but it does look like people are being admitted. Great. And can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, I think I think we'll go, get, go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. You have arrived at our community meeting. Um, this meeting is about safe parking pilot program with the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, before we get into the meeting itself, um, Shannon, if you can provide some uh, information about our translation services. Yes, thank you and welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to ask the interpreter currently on the Spanish channel to go ahead and commence translation of the meeting. Uh, for our guests joining us this evening, live translation can be heard on the Spanish channel. To join the Spanish channel, click the uh, interpretation icon on your Zoom toolbar. It looks like a globe. Once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend you shut off the main audio so you clearly hear the Spanish translation. I believe I have Pablo on to translate what I just said, please. Bienvenidos a esta noche, eh, la reunión de esta noche de estacionamiento seguro. E interpretación en vivo estará disponible esta noche para la reunión. Para unirse al canal de interpretación, puede hacer clic en el icono en la barra de herramientas de Zoom que parece un globo. Cuando se une al canal de español, usted podrá poner en mudo el audio primario para que solo escuche la interpretación claramente. Thank you. Great. So my name is Claire Hartman. I'm the interim assistant city manager and I work with the city's homeless services uh, program team, and I'm going to serve as facilitator tonight. So what this meeting is all about is our safe parking pilot program. Um, as you know, the city has declared an emergency on homelessness. Um, and in response to that, um, we have many different uh, programs in place, but one of them is going to be looking at safe parking as a pilot. Um, and this program is going to be operated by um, Catholic Charities as a provider, and it's going to address community members who are experiencing homelessness and provide them a safe place to park while we wrap services and provide support um, to, to get them uh, into housing. So one of the key attributes to all of our programs is that they're housing first. So this is not a destination, it's a path to housing. So it, you'll see that we spent quite a bit of time um, uh, looking at this program with that lens. So in a few minutes, we'll hear from uh, Mayor Rogers. Uh, he was here tonight, thank you. And, uh, but first I'd like to go over our agenda so you kind of uh, get a feel for what we're gonna cover tonight. Uh, so we're gonna uh, hear from Mayor Rogers. We will also um, have an opportunity to hear from Council Member, uh, Council Member Natalie Rogers. Um, she'll be here tonight as well. Uh, Tom Swellhome has also uh, joined us, thank you. And then we're going to go over a presentation about what this uh, program will entail, um, how it's been designed, uh, what, we, what we intend to support it with, um, and all the, the thought that's gone into, especially the wraparound services um, and making this a, a, a good fit for not only those that will be using the services, but, um, but how it fits into the, into the site. And then we will open it up to questions. So really the, the whole purpose of this meeting is to answer your questions. Um, so we really wanna hear from you. We wanna put the most time into that. Um, and then we'll wrap up. So we are looking at um, holding this meeting until seven o'clock. So again, um, we know if you have comments, we'd like to hear those as well. Um, but if we can get to as many questions tonight as possible, um, that would be fantastic. Uh, so before we... Um, Hear from Mayor Rogers. Uh, Shannon, I think there's uh, some instructions on how our participants will be able to participate um, later in the, in the session. Can you provide us that? Yes, thank you. Um, 
So for as the as members of the public join our meeting, uh, you will be joining uh, as an attendee in Zoom. Your, I'm sorry, can you hear me? I just had a weird glitch. Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay. Uh, your microphone and camera will be muted when you join. Only today's panelists will be viewed during the meeting. If you are calling in from a telephone for privacy concerns, the host will be renaming your viewable phone to resident, the viewable phone number, to resident and the last four digits of your phone number. Once the panel has completed their presentation, we will move on to item three on the agenda, the community feedback session. At that time, the moderator will ask that you raise your hand in Zoom if you have a question. The Zoom host will move one by one down the list with, of attendees with their hands raised. Once you have asked your question, the Zoom host will lower your hand. Each guest wishing to speak will have three minutes on the timer. If you do hear your question asked and answered prior to your turn, we ask that you lower your hand so we can move through as many questions as possible. One last note, this meeting is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be available to the public on the safe parking webpage at srcity.org. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, I, I would like to introduce also all of the um, panelists that we'll have tonight. Um, I wanna do that here at the front end so you know who's here um, uh, to answer your questions tonight. We have uh, Kelly Kuykendall. She is our program manager for home homeless services for the city. Uh, we have Jenny Lynn Holmes. Um, and she is our chief program officer representing Catholic Charities, our provider um, for this program. We're also here from our public safety representatives. We have uh, Battalion Chief John Abers, as well as Captain John Cregan from our, I'm sorry, John Abers from our fire department and Captain Cregan from our uh, police department. And in addition, we'll also have Jason Nutt, who's our assistant city manager. So with that, Mayor. No, I really appreciate that, Claire. And I wanna thank everybody for being here today to talk about this. Uh, I'll say uh, our team has been working really hard, not just on this project, but across the city, trying to figure out how we both balance the needs of our community, uh, as well as how do we help lift folks out of homelessness. And one thing that's become very apparent in the last couple of years as we've done this is that we need a broad diversity of types of services in Santa Rosa to be able to get the most people into the services that they need to ultimately end homelessness. And the city of Santa Rosa does have a goal of functional zero homelessness, uh, where we do have opportunities for all to be able to address the specific needs that they have to help get them off the streets. And we also understand that it can be a little bit scary for neighbors as well. And um, we've had a couple of these community meetings as we've rolled out services where what we're really looking for is to make sure that nobody has any questions about how it'll operate. Uh, first and foremost, let's make sure we get all of the questions on the table for discussion. And then second, let us know what your concerns are. And our team really does try to go out of their way to address any of those concerns and craft a program that's gonna be beneficial for an, our entire community. And that really helps move progress forward. So I wanna thank you for being here and taking the time on a Wednesday night. We'll be staying through until the seven o'clock time if we need to. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over and actually give Council Member Schwethelm an opportunity to say a couple of words as well. Thank you, uh, Mayor Rogers. And I also wanna extend my gratitude for everyone who's joined this webinar to learn a little bit about this project. Uh, my role, both tonight and for the city is on the continuum of care board. Uh, the city of Santa Rosa is one of the three entitled jurisdictions in Sonoma County. That means we receive direct funding from HUD to uh, address homeless services. And one of the things that you will see tonight is the collaboration with our community partner and department partners. In my role on the continuum of care, we are trying to be consistent with that. So I really look forward to answering any questions that everyone who is listening in can understand the goals that we're trying to achieve and how we're collaborating with everyone to reduce homelessness in Santa Rosa. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And now we'll hear from Kelly and Jenny Lynn and they have their presentation. So thank you for putting that up. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Claire and Mayor Rogers and Councilmember Schwellen for 
kicking us off and I just want to extend my gratitude to all the community members that are joining us this. It is evening, it's getting dark out there. So um, Jenny Lynn Holmes with Catholic Charities and myself will be doing a brief presentation on the Safe Parking Pilot Program. Next slide, please. This slide uh, is an overview of the presentation. I'm gonna to touch briefly on the city's homeless services programs and the scale of, of, of the issue of homelessness in, in Sonoma County and Santa Rosa, specifically uh, focusing on um, uh, individuals living in, in vehicles and RVs. Uh, I'll touch on city council direction in terms of how we arrived where we are today and um, implementation of the program. Uh, we'll cover the pilot program, both the purpose and design. I'm going to touch on uh, uh, some of the frequently asked questions that we received to date, uh, general themes. I'll cover resources. Uh, we'll also be hearing from um, Captain Cregan from the police department. And then we're going to hand it over to the community feedback session to hear from you. Next slide, please. So for homeless services programs, I won't spend a whole lot of time here. I do want to just point out that the city um, is uh, supporting and funding homeless services in five key areas. Uh, that includes day services, emergency shelter, street outreach and encampment resolution, housing support. So those are resources and programs available to help people move, help persons experiencing homelessness um, move from homelessness to housing and then community-based solutions. So we have provided uh, grant funds to our faith-based partners who are serving homeless community members. We've also stood up a number of programs um, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Those efforts continue um, so that we can try to serve our, um, our community members that are experiencing homelessness as well as reduce uh, uh, impacts to the community at large during um, the pandemic. We're also very excited um, to launch in response, which has been led by the police department and several community partners. And Captain Cregan will touch on that at the close of the presentation. Next slide, please. For the scale of the issue, um, I have some data here from our homeless count and then also from uh, surveys that we've done. So based on the most recent uh, homeless point in time count and survey that was conducted in January of 2020, uh, that survey found approximately 800 individuals living in vehicles and RVs in Sonoma County. If you drill down into that data, there are approximately 500 um, individuals living in vehicles and RVs. And our team, our encampment team, did a, a windshield survey over the summer. This is an undercount, not everybody, but we estimated approximately 300 um, RVs and vehicles that are um, uh, occupied by people living out of them in Santa Rosa. We also do a weekly um, survey of encampments and areas of concern. And the current estimates show about 200 to 300 um, RVs and vehicles that are, that are occupied. I do wanna share with you all that the, the pilot program that we're, we're pitching tonight and preparing to implement is not a cure-all. Um, we wanna recognize that this program does not meet the scale of the issue or the need in the community. It will, however, be a tool to help us with our encampment response. Um, it will also be a tool to help engage individuals into services, um, shelter, and ultimately ho housing. We'll continue to have to prioritize encampments um, available to uh, relevant to uh, available resources, and um, encampments will continue to be an issue in our community. But this program is the first step. Um, in trying to uh, address uh, uh, vehicle encampments. Next slide, please. I think the mayor touched on this a little bit, but safe parking has been the subject of um, several city council meetings over the past uh, few years. Uh, back in, or most recently back in June, staff presented a study session to council uh, and presented a number of uh, different program models, including uh, an overnight model um, and a 24-7 model. We also looked at sites in each of the seven council districts 
And we're going to start with one since we haven't done this before. This is a pilot program, and it was staff rec staff's recommendation to council that we start with one site. Um, I'll go more into why we selected this particular site when we get into the, I have a few slides on the, the FAQs. The direction that staff received from council in June was that we should implement a one-year pilot program. It should be 24 seven um, versus just overnight, that it should include wraparound services targeted at um, helping people transition from homelessness into housing, that this, the site should provide up to 50 spots and that it would be located at 55 Stony Point Road. We also received directions to, uh, direction uh, to go out for requests for proposals which we did in September. And then staff went back to council in December and recommended Catholic Charities as the operator and they were selected by the council to be the operator. Next slide, please. So in terms of purpose, uh, there's three key, um, uh, you know, purpose for the program. It's to address uh, immediate shelter needs, uh, reduce community impact and connect individuals experiencing homelessness and services with services and housing. And again, I will re reiterate, we're not pitching this as a cure-all for, for um, homelessness or to solve our encampments in Santa Rosa. Next slide. So this is a, um, a site uh, plan for the pilot program. I understand this probably isn't super easy to see, but we did want to share a visual with you. Um, you can see that the proposed uh, site plan takes up the first two uh, rows of the parking lot at 55 Stony, Stony Point Road. Um, this particular um, plan provides for 43 total vehicles. That includes 13 RVs and 30 vehicles, and there's going to be some flexibility in that um, once we open the program, depending on the community need, uh, so long as uh, we don't go outside of the footprint. This is the footprint that we have to work with. Uh, this site plan includes uh, perimeter fencing and sanitary facilities, so portable toilets and hand washing stations. Um, there'll be a bathroom shower trailer, as well as uh, refuse uh, containers and recycle containers. There's a designated pet and smoking area and also uh, a, a tent for staff. With that, I'll turn it over to Jenny Lynn Holmes and she's gonna touch on the program design. Next slide, please. Great, thank you, Kelly. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the safe parking program here. We're uh, excited to be able to work with the city of Santa Rosa on this kind of new uh, option for individuals who are unsheltered in our community. Just as a little bit of background, uh, this isn't the first time we've operated a safe parking program in our community. We have actually were able to operate one several years ago that was uh, at multiple sites throughout uh, the city and the county. So we have some great experience from that, as well as the operations of the Finley Safe Social Distancing Program we operated earlier in the pandemic times. Uh, to uh, help individuals with accessing services and to be able to safely social distance um, uh, while we were working through our ongoing COVID safety protocols. So there's some ex uh, lots of lessons learned in all of those different programs we've operated in the past, and we're excited to be able to offer this uh, new opportunity of a kind of different way for to engage individuals who are living in their vehicles. So uh, you'll see a few bullet points here, but just so you know, Catholic Charities will be managing this site. Uh, it will be 24-7 uh, staff and or security and oftentimes both at the location. Uh, we'll be working with kind of the existing infrastructure we've been able to work with the city on with regards to our outreach teams and our shelter programs to get the to kind of screen and work with people out in the uh, community and find the right fits for individuals for them as well as for the program. Uh, in particular, we'll be looking at individuals who have been uh, living in our community for an extended period of time uh, in their vehicles, whether it's an RV or their car, and working with them to get ready to possibly be in this location. Our goal of the program, as was mentioned, we can't serve everybody who's experiencing uh, homelessness and living in their vehicles right now, but we do hope that this can be a model moving forward. 
And our hope is when we are able to get individuals into the program is that our kind of wraparound support team will be able to work with them on long-term housing opportunities. Our goal is to uh, use this as an engagement opportunity uh, and not necessarily a long-term solution, really. We wanna be getting people into housing and getting them out of their vehicles and into safe housing. So that is the ultimate overarching goal of this program is to find the individual's housing um, in a much more sustainable fashion. We've had a lot of success doing that over the years in a variety of our different programs. Uh, some of the services we'll be offering, as Kelly kind of mentioned, is shower, sanitary, sanitary facilities, refuse containers, la we'll have laundry services, meals, and then what's really most important and hardest to kind of point to the physical option of is we'll be having our case management team uh, working with the individuals living in this site. That was something we didn't have in the first uh, version of safe parking we operated many years ago. And so this is really the way we think we're going to resolve homelessness for these individuals by connecting them to community referrals, growing their income and coming up with the long-term sustainable housing plans. We'll also be working with our behavioral health uh, support partners as well as our medical uh, health partners. We have had, created some very strong uh, connections with our uh, medical support teams in the community and we'll continue to offer that service at this location as well. Uh, next slide. Just to kind of talk about our COVID-19 safety protocols, uh, we have been working for an uh, extended period of time through the pandemic in all of our sites. We have not had to close any of our sites down because of uh, the enhanced protocols we've been able to take. Uh, we This includes screening uh, measures where we actually do screening of individuals coming in. That includes testing um, as well as symptom checks and so on and so forth. And we also hold a lot of prevention measures. Uh, our site is one of the sites that is allowed to actually do um, enhanced level of testing. We have um, uh, protective equipment that'll be available for our staff as well as enhanced uh, sanitation options and masking options for the individuals that'll be living with us. Um, you, we've gotten very good over the last uh, two years of being able to really know uh, what works with the safety protocols right now. And, Currently, our transmission rate is at about 5% uh, in one of our shelters, which is much lower than the community transmission rate of 18%. So that is a really good note that our prevention measures are working and we plan to replicate that at this site as well. Uh, another important part of our operations is what we call our good neighbor agreement. For individuals who are living in any of the programs that we operate at, at whatever site it might be, we do ask that while they're there, they are a good neighbor as a part of that the community that they're residing in at that moment. Uh, that includes, you know, helping to keep be an, a proactive uh, kind of member of that community, uh, helping to ensure that behavior is appropriate not only to the program that they are living in, but also to the surrounding neighborhood. And if behavior is such that it does not conducive to kind of this, this program living area or the community that surrounds it, there could be options that that person will no longer be able to maintain residency in that program. So that is something that is important to us as a commitment to the neighborhood and the communities that we work in. A couple of other quick guidelines, and we'll get more in depth as we go through the frequently asked questions and hear from the public, but uh, we do have a pets and service animals policy. We are trying to work with individuals and rather than set up barriers that make it hard for them to access services, we want to be able to uh, engage the individuals to work with us. And that sometimes means working with their pets and working with their service animals, which we service animals we are required to do. Uh, but oftentimes they come together and we've actually found that as an enhanced form of care for individuals. We'll be setting up, we've, and when we do programs, we have kind of specialized pet programming areas. We have partnerships with uh, vets and so on and so forth to be able to make sure that the animals that are living with us at the same time are also uh, receiving good care um, with uh, while they're in the program. We will have a curfew. Um, that's uh, for a lot of different reasons, but um, one of them is to make sure we're maintaining up-to-date census and that we're ensuring that we know where people are so that we can hold safety for them and themselves. Um, and that is something we do at a lot of our different programs. And we won't necessarily be inviting, allowing visitors or guests at the site, mostly because it is a, a consolidated area and it's also part of our COVID-19 safety protocols. We are trying to minimize the traffic of uh, people coming in and out, again, to maintain the safety of the site, as well as to um, make sure everyone is still staying safe, especially during this surge in cases. So 
those are some of the very high level. There's a lot more detail around the programming uh, that we could talk about. We're happy to do so, but I'll turn it back over to Kelly and I'll probably help her out here and there with the frequently asked questions. Thank you, Jenny Lynn. Next slide, please. I have just a few uh, slides here. There's three slides dedicated to FAQs, just some of the general themes I'm seeing and the questions that are coming in. So I'll cover those briefly and I'll have Jenny Lynn and um, Captain Cregan help me out as well. But the first one is site selection. One of the questions I get frequently from staff, um, city staff, because this is a, a city owned parking lot and it's used by employees as well as the public is, how did you uh, decide on this site? And I'll tell you, it wasn't an easy uh, process. Uh, we, in, we started with city property. So those that are you know, under our, our purview, so we evaluated more than 100 uh, sites that are owned by the city. Uh, we did um, select a site in our preferred site in each of the seven council districts. I did mention that um, we recommended starting with one site, one pilot program, since the city has not done this before. Um, and for this particular site, the 55 Stony Point Road, um, this one was selected because of all the ones we looked at, it presented the least impact to the public. Um, it's not directly adjacent to a school or a neighborhood. And I do recognize that it's right across the street from uh, the Finley Community Center and Park. However, it's not a directly adjacent to that. So it wasn't an easy choice for us to arrive at this decision. And we did a very thorough evaluation for, for selecting this, the, the site. Uh, in terms of outreach, um, for both of the council meetings I mentioned in June and also in December, uh, uh, information went out about um, those council meetings on the city's website and also via our e-newsletter, uh, City Connections, and on our social media outlet. Uh, for today's meeting, uh, we did the same, plus um, we did push out information via Nextdoor and a postcard mailing went out uh, with a, within a quarter radius of the site. So. Um, there has been extensive community outreach to make you know, the public aware of, of this program. In terms of uh, timeline, um, we're um, aiming towards opening this program next month. Another question I get is, when is it going to close? How long is it going to be running for? So it's a one-year pilot program to start. We have identified funds to run the program for two years, but we will be evaluating whether or not we're going to continue the program um, prior to completion of this one-year pilot. And then manage site versus encampment. I get that question a lot from the community. How is this going to be different than what we're seeing in terms of encampments all throughout Santa Rosa and Sonoma County? And so this is going to be managed versus unmanaged. And so uh, there will be uh, many facilities in place in the program that will prevent a lot of the things that we're seeing in encampments in terms of public health and safety issues. I mentioned uh, having um, refuse containers available and portable toilets and hand washing stations. It's also going to be managed with staff and security. So uh, it's going to look very different than what we're all used to seeing in, in, in the community. And uh, another question is city and county partnership. How are we working with our, our county um, parts on this and the staff, we meet with um, county staff and staff from other cities throughout Sonoma County on a regular basis. Council member Schwethelm mentioned that he's on the board of the Continuum of Care and that's our regional pl uh, planning body for ending homelessness. And I do wanna give a shout out to the county. Um, they are the board of supervisors approved $500,000 for this program. Last question on this slide in terms of how can I help, which is one of my favorite questions. Um, we're not looking for volunteers at this point in time just because of COVID, um, but we will be pushing out information on ways to help. Um, it'll prob probably largely be uh, looking for donations and that information will go out on our website prior to the, the program opening. Next slide, please. So for FAQs um, in terms of site and program operations, and I know Jenny Lynn and I already touched on some of these, but there were a few themes I did want to cover um, in terms of cost and budget. So I mentioned that we've identified funds for, for two years. Um, we've identified uh, $2.8 million. 
Um, and that's a mix of city resources. And I mentioned uh, the county funding that's contributing to the program as well. And our contract with Catholic Charities for the first year of program operations is $1.3 million. With vehicle compliance and towing, uh, vehicles will have to be running um, and operable in order to come into the program. Um, should they have issues once they come in, we'll be addressing those um, and working with the participants um, to, to see that the vehicle is either repaired or towed. So those are some contingencies that we do anticipate in the program. Length of stay. The typical length of stay for emergency shelter is six months. Um, however, we will be evaluating um, length of stay for the participants on an um, individual case-by-case -case basis. And then reporting and evaluation um, as part of the contract we have with Catholic Charities. They will have to submit monthly reports to the city. We're gonna be meeting with them. We have already been meeting with them a lot, but we're gonna be meeting with them on a regular basis as we work towards launching the program and then within the first couple months. Um, so ongoing communication, meetings, and then regular reports. And then a really important component of this program is a housing strategy. I know Jenny Lynn touched on that. I will say at the moment, we're focused on getting this program, the site set up um, and the program ready to welcome participants. Um, at the same time, we're also looking at housing strategy um, to move uh, people from, from homelessness into housing. But our, our focus right now is getting the program up and running. Next slide. Uh, this is the last slide on FAQs, and then there's only a couple more as part of the presentation, and I've done plenty of talking here, so I'm going to ask Jenny Lynn and Captain Cregan to jump in. Um, Jenny Lynn, if you can talk about security um, and scaling that up or down, and then um, uh, drugs and alcohol in terms of our behavior-based model, and then Captain Cregan, I would love uh, to hear from you on uh, searches and background checks, and then also police presence and response. And then of course, let's wrap it up uh, this slide with in response. Thank you. Great. Well, I'll start off really quick. So security, so we do uh, have, we will have a security company at the site. We uh, project that we'll start that for the first three months, and then we'll take that time to evaluate if we really do need a 24 seven security response. Uh, when we have operated these programs in the past and when we operated safe parking in the past, it was clear that uh, once the operations got up and running and things were, uh, the logistics were worked out, it ended up becoming um, not a necessity and it is a very expensive endeavor. We wanna make sure but we that we keep everyone safe, both the participants and the community. Uh, and that will be something we'll continue to evaluate with the city as we see how the operations continue. Um, with regards to drugs and alcohol, we are a behavior-based program, and for those that are not familiar with that, is that we will be dealing with uh, behavior, whether it's uh, related to drugs or alcohol, or whether it's not related to drugs or alcohol. We have seen it on all different um, avenues, and we know that just because someone is under the influence doesn't mean that their behavior is necessarily not conducive to health and safety. We also know on the other end, there are people who are sober who also have at times created behavioral issues in our community and things and law enforcement, you know, for example, sometimes has to step in. Uh, but we are a behavior based model. We want to engage and bring people in. We know that not um, by screening people out of our programs, we're not giving them the access they need and deserve. And it ultimately doesn't resolve the long term issues of mental health, substance abuse, addiction. Uh, housing and security and so on and so forth. So we can bring people in, we can work with them and help them deal with the root cause of what brought them to homelessness in the first place. So that's the model we'll be employing here. We've had a lot of success at all of our sites with that um, and we'll continue to do so and work with individuals. And again, if behavior is not conducive to the community we are working in and or the other participants in the program, that is where our staff comes in and is able to uh, mitigate those concerns. So with that, I'll turn it over to Captain Cregan and mention we do have a close working relationship with Santa Rosa Police Department. Uh, our outreach team, which is doing daily work with this population, knows these individuals very, very well. So we can usually deescalate uh, pretty quickly when issues do arise because of the trust and the relationship we built with them. Um, and again, we do work very closely with the Santa Rosa Police Department uh, should the need arise uh, during these program operations. So I'll let Captain Cregan finish out this slide. Thank you, Jay Lynn. And, and that was one of the things that I was gonna lead with is this, that close relationship, not only with Catholic Charities, 
and Jenny Lamb and, and, and their staff, but also with Kelly and the rest of the city team that we're, we're literally talking daily and working through some of these issues. So I know there's gonna be community concerns and even from our city employees who work in that area, that concerns can come up and that's important, just that constant communication with our team of addressing these and immediately taking steps from the police department. So one of the things that comes up from the community is asking like, hey, are you gonna be doing random searches of the vehicles or the RVs or checking bags and things like when you walk into an airport, but it's, it's important to understand that both our housed community and our unhoused community have the same constitutional rights under the Fourth Amendment. So the police department doesn't have the legal authority to go in and do random searches of vehicles of RVs. So we're not going to be able to do that, but they will have the site rules on there from Catholic charity staff and the security staff that's uh, working through the area. If we were to re receive a report of a weapon or any type of illegal contraband, then the police department would follow the legal steps to be able to investigate that incident. But there aren't gonna be like random searches or checks and, and, and make sure that those individuals that are there have their own sanctity uh, of their privacy and their legal rights to be able to stay there in the uh, encampment. But if a report of a weapon, drugs, any type of other offense, then the police department will step in and investigate just like we would any other complaint around the city. Another important question that comes in is with the background checks. So that's a complex issue because the California and federal law doesn't allow law enforcement to do random uh, criminal history searches. So I can't just say, oh, I want to look at so-and-so's criminal history and see that there has to be a legal and investigative means to do that. So just being present in a safe parking program is not enough of a legal means. Now, Catholic Charities does have a program in place for looking at some of the public uh, source documents such as Megan's Law, which looks at uh, sex registrants, and they have a process they will be screening, looking for sex registrants, and that's going to be one of the disqualifying uh, characteristics to have on there. And But the same thing happens. If we are in there investigating some type of criminal behavior, then we will be able to run some of those checks. But the most important thing is our downtown enforcement team, our beat officers, they work very closely with Catholic Charities and with Kelly and her team. And contrary to popular belief, most of the homeless are from right here in Sonoma County. We've had contacts with over the years and we're very well aware and have, and, and really a lot of our downtown enforcement officers are on a first name basis uh, with some of our, of our homeless community. So it's gonna be continuing to work. And if there's someone that has a violent class and that has a con community concern, then we're gonna work with the Catholic Charity staff and with Kelly's to make sure that that's recognized and that uh, we can take any steps to um, address that. The police presence is gonna be an important one. So this is located the city is uh, uh, designated the nine different police zones. This is zone five. So if you go to the police department website, it breaks down uh, the different police zones or beats as they may be referred to. And beat five has a dedicated sergeant and a dedicated police lieutenant. So right now is Sergeant Michael Clark uh, is the sergeant who maintains the officers. And there's nine different officers who work that patrol zone are gonna be very familiar with uh, the city facility and be having an increased presence and Lieutenant Janine Cooker, who's the Lieutenant in charge of that. So both of those are available. Their emails are on our website and it says mclark at srcity.org or jrcooker at srcity.org. And always feel free to email me. My name is Jay Cregan at srcity.org and I manage our field services division, which includes all uniform personnel. So if there's community issues that are coming up, concerns, if you're not happy with the police presence in that area, you can call me anytime, email me, and I will promise that I'm gonna take some steps to make sure that we address it. But what we will be doing is working with the officers who work in that area, make sure they're parking patrol cars in the area, responding, but at the same time, giving some privacy to our homeless individuals who are staying there, but they will have a presence and we will be responsive and working with security and with Catholic Charities if there are any criminal offenses or criminal behavior that occurs not only in the safe parking location, or in the surrounding area, Finley Park or any of the neighboring businesses in that area. So the most important thing is we've, we've done this successfully before and we, we've seen some of the other, whether it be city facilities or even county facilities out at the Los Gilicos site, we've worked there, we've worked with our beat officers and we, we're really seeing this be successful from the police department's uh, perspective in the past and haven't seen a big increase in crime and other issues in that area. So we're very optimistic that's gonna continue uh, to see the same with this program, but we're going to be evaluating it. We'll be working and we're willing to step in and um, take steps of any criminal behavior that does occur. I'll turn it back over to you, Kelly.
Thanks, John. All right, so I think we're just about ready to wrap it up. Next slide, please. Oh, did you want to talk about in response, John, briefly? How could I forget? Sorry. So <laughs> uh, the in response team and uh, just yesterday, we're so excited. Our city came together to be able to launch the new in response mental health support team. So this is a team uh, designated of a licensed mental health clinician from the County of Sonoma Behavioral Health, a paramedic from the Santa Rosa Fire Department, and a homeless outreach specialist from Catholic Charities that are riding together in one vehicle as a multidisciplinary team that responds to working with mental health, crisis, substance abuse, and homeless in our community. So it's gonna be a, another key asset that our city and our team can use in this program. Not only are they able to provide support if there's any mental health or substance abuse issues and be able to provide some of the targeted support and assistance to get them the help that they need, but that'll be just another asset. And they'll be stopping by, they'll be swinging by, building relationships with those and making sure they're leading with some of the services uh, that our team can be able to offer. We also have a host of system navigators that are gonna be embedded as part of this team. So that's gonna be another resource that they'll be making contacts, providing out some flyers and some of the resources. And the same thing for our community members uh, and whether it be business, city uh, employees who work in that area or just neighboring businesses, that'll be another resource. If you are seeing any problems or especially any um, what may be considered suspicious behavior or anyone out there, that in response team. So in response can be uh, contacted by calling any number at the police department or we have a dedicated line of 575 help, which is 575-4357. So you can call that and that goes directly to a dispatcher, which is answering calls uh, to be able to dispatch that in response team. And that team went out to their first calls last night and I, I went and met with them this afternoon and they're, they're out currently responding to calls as we speak. So that'll be another great resource that's gonna be able to assist the community members in this area and our, our community members which are staying at this facility. Thanks, John. We're all very excited about in response. Um, I've got just two more slides and we'll wrap it up and turn it over to uh, the community that are participating in the meeting. So next steps, I, I did mention that we're trying to get this open by next month. Uh, Catholic Charities is currently hiring new staff for the program and we'll be doing some training. Uh, I mentioned our focus right now is getting that site set up so we can welcome participants in. And then uh, the goal is probably mid-March, I mean, sorry, mid-February to late February and early March. Uh, we'd be doing a phased opening of the program. So not bringing in all the participants at once, but phasing that in um, over the first uh, you know, month or so of the program. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, resources. Uh, we have a very robust uh, FAQ that we put together for this program that's available on our dedicated webpage at srcity.org uh, forward slash safe parking. Um, I, I will say we'll be posting program updates there um, as well as information about ways to help prior to opening the program. We have an email, uh, homeless at srcity.org. If you have any uh, further questions or concerns after the meeting today, please um, send them our way. And then we will have a dedicated phone number for the program. Um, and it, I don't have that this, this evening, but it will be established prior to opening and we'll make that information available on our website. And it's gonna be a phone for line for the program, not for you know, all homeless related concerns throughout Santa Rosa. Um, with that, I'm uh, finished with the presentation and uh, wanna turn it back over to Claire to um, open it up to the community feedback session. Thank you very much. Great. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. Um, having uh, watched staff uh, put this together, uh, it's been an evolving process. So first, I want to thank all the community members that took the time to send in their questions and concerns because it's a pilot program. It's iterative. We want to inform the program with your with what you are concerned about or what you think we should address in the program. So this is not the end of the conversation is gonna continue. So as you can see, we've already informed the program with, with a lot of what you've provided. So we're gonna move into um, questions um, uh, for the panel. And I see that um, we do have some that were placed in the uh, Q&A or the chat. Um, what we're gonna do is we'd like to take live comment, uh, questions first, um, and then I can uh, review the, uh, the written ones and, 
and we can uh, we can make sure that those get answered as well. But again, just to reiterate, um, it does. It's it, this is just a part of the 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 journey, if you will. Um, so continue to monitor the website for the program. Um, we are looking to engage you all along the process. That's the whole purpose of a pilot is we're learning together with it. Um, and we can be adaptive to, uh, to uh, things that uh, you raise that, that we can build into the program. Um, and also um, emailing uh, home, homeless at srcity.org. If there's questions you think of after the meeting um, or things that you want us to share, um, you continue the conversation is my, my emphasis. So with that, um, Shannon, if you can walk us through how um, our participants um, can participate and how we're gonna orchestrate that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so basically what we'll do is I see we have some hands raised. I will go down the list um, of those who have their hands raised. I will uh, I'll allow you to speak. It's the a function on my end. So I'll announce who the first speaker is. And then I will also um, enable your speaker permissions and ask you to unmute yourself. Um, and then I will bring up the timer. You'll have three minutes. Uh, and then I'll also, uh, when I announce the speaker, I'll, I'll announce who's going to be the next speaker as well. Um, and please identify yourself um, at the beginning for our public record. Thank you. So, sorry, the first speaker we have is Maggie Munat. And uh, I will go ahead and you can unmute yourself, you're ready to go. Hi there, uh, thanks for being here and uh, thanks for the in response, I think that's awesome. I have a, um, a homeless mentally ill brother and uh, I had a couple of questions. Um, uh, he's not signed up yet, I wasn't sure. Um, does that have to go th through Catholic, Catholic charities in order to sign up for this? And are there openings? Uh, Okay, I don't know if I'm gonna get that answered. So that's a question. Um, and then um, it sounds like there has to be a um, an attached vehicle. So does it need to have the, it can't be a trailer that doesn't have a vehicle to it or it has to be a movable vehicle, it sounds like. I just like clarification on that. And if there are any other safe parking planned for the future, that's all I have. Three questions. Thanks, Maggie. Um, Claire, I know you're a facilitator. Do you want me to just jump in and get started on that? Yeah, maybe what we can do is, you know, we can, I think some of these questions, I think uh, probably mo most of them will follow you, Kelly or Jenny Lynn as the provider, um, but uh, feel free. We have a full panel. I want to remind everyone we have our representatives from public safety, um, uh, from police, as well as fire, as well as Jason that's joined us for as our interim I'm sorry, I'm in as the assistant city manager. So we have a full house here um, available to answer questions. So go ahead and, um, and take them as, as they come up. So in terms of sign up, Jenny Lynn, I know we're gonna be um, working with our homeless outreach services team, which is uh, one of Catholic Charities programs that the city funds. And they're very involved in our encampments, including with our uh, our, city encampment team, the homeless encampment assistance program. So those two groups will, will work together to identify individuals for the program. Um, Jalen, I don't know if you want to touch a little bit about, you know, how you're going to be identifying and prioritizing individuals beyond that. Yeah, I would say it'll, uh, right now we're, as we're kind of ramping up the site, um, you know, we will be looking and working with the individuals that we know are experiencing homelessness in their vehicles uh, in the community right now. Um, I would say if anybody is ever in need of help, um, whether they are living in the vehicle or not, they can call our host hotline and that number is 707-978-8329. That will also be a great way if you know someone who, wants, who needs a referral into safe parking, you can go ahead and use that as well. As Kelly mentioned, we will have a dedicated phone at the site, but that won't necessarily, that will more be to deal with community issues and concerns. Uh, the host hotline that I just man mentioned is um, going to be available for people to be able to use to get someone in need of services uh, engaged, whether it's safe parking or any service that they need uh, that Catholic Charities or the community can offer. And I can put that number in the chat box as well in case you didn't catch my quick uh, ramble of it. 
And then your other question about a trailer without a vehicle. Um, you know, these are all things that we're, we're navigating right now and trying to figure out. I would say that we would take a trailer that doesn't have a vehicle as long as there's a way to get it to the, the site um, and that that trailer is in, you know, uh, decent condition. Um, and we're going to be doing a, a training with Catholic Charities um, and some of, other, of our other staff in the city to, to develop some, you know, basic threshold basic criteria that um, the trailers, RVN vehicles need to meet to enter the program. I think the other question was if there's other safe parking sites. Um, oh, thank you. I know, yeah, I know there's a few, there's a couple I know. I know that there's Sebastopol, City of Sebastopol is setting up one and the County of Sonoma is also looking at different options. I'm not as engaged on, on those, but I do know there are some safe parking programs popping up all over our county. Um, and, uh, the C city of Sebastopol, I think, um, has one that's going to be similar to us. It'll be operated by, uh, saves. We do have a few, um, faith-based partners that provide safe parking, but I, I know that all of those sites are full. Um, and in terms of the city of Santa Rosa and future, uh, endeavors into safe parking, we're, we're going to start with this one site and see how it goes and then evaluate. Um, you know, whether or not we would, would scale up. But right now we're starting with this one site. Okay, our next speaker uh, is Ar Arlie Haig, uh, followed by Tracy. Arlie, go ahead and unmute yourself, please. And I think I will not pull up the timer. Um, doesn't seem like the questions will be three minutes long. So unless you guys think I should, um, I'll just let people ask their questions, okay? Yes, hi, my name, am I on? I'm Arlie Haig, I am on the board of SAVES and we're working hard in Sebastopol. Um, my, I have about a number of questions. Do you have an operations manual that's available to the public for this site? Um, are there kids allowed? Uh, what are you gonna do about um, checking for sexual predators and, um, our visitor, what about the visitor guidelines and those kinds of checks for visitors? And are the vehicles to be registered uh, in addition to being functional? Those are my questions and good presentation, guys. Thanks. I can take a couple of them if you want me to start off, Kelly. Um, so we don't we have a, an operations manual for our all of our programs at this point. We This is, this is a new program. We're still designing the program manual. And some of that will be informed by the community and what we hear here tonight. So while we don't have one now, we will likely have one in the future. And we're happy to share that and especially best practices with other operators like SAFES. Um, in terms of uh, individuals who are registered sex offenders, that is part of the check that we do, we are able to do. And Captain Creek can speak more to that, but we do that in our all of our programs where we do check um, for registered sex offenders uh, and make sure that we are working with those restrictions in our guidelines and funding as well. A um, couple other ones I wrote down is visitor guidelines. I think I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we're not going to be allowing visitors at the beginning. Um, primarily, that's kind of our uh, existing protocol at all of our sites. This is to mitigate against uh, potential COVID-19 exposure and trying to keep the uh, site safe. With the individuals that are living in our program, we're regularly testing and screening to uh, make sure that they are safe for themselves and for the community they're living in. And um, having visitors in the site makes that a little bit harder, um, at least to, at the onset and with we're kind of uh, starting out with here in the surge uh, that we're currently experiencing. Um, and then vehicle registration, um, that's something that we are not requiring, um, but it is something we're going to be working with individuals on, as well as getting what we call document ready and getting their uh, insurance and all of those things lined up. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's really important to us to, um, to make sure that we are uh, screening people in rather than out um, and having people access um, the care that they need rather than not being able to enter the system. So we want to make it as low barrier as possible. But that also means that we have uh, individuals who need to get these things, documents in place for them to be eligible for housing and other sorts of income uh, in our community. So that is part of our case management process once they are in 
the program. And then in terms of kids allowed right now, I believe we are, Kelly can correct me, we are looking at this as a single adult program. We're not uh, going to be looking at families at this point. The data shows that most of people experiencing uh, homelessness or living in their vehicles are single adults. Uh, we do have other programs in the community for families. Uh, our Family Support Center is one of those, and there's others across the county that we can work with to get individuals who are living in families access to care. So I think I caught them all, but if anyone else wants to chime in, please let me know. <laughs> Did you touch on sexual predators early? I had a question about that. And I know, Captain Cregan, you mentioned the Megan's Law, the state database is a, a tool that's available to Catholic charities to screen any participants. So that, yeah, that'll be the, the most important one. So that's a pretty common one with Megan's Law. So everyone will be screened. So anyone who's convicted of a sexual offense that qualifies and a judge would order that either for a specified time or even up to life for serious offenses, they need to be ordered to register as a sex offender. So not only would they have to be coming into our domestic violence, sexual assault detectives and registering uh, whatever location they're at, but they'd be, and that's one of the disqualifying uh, characteristics or offenses for not being part of that. So also the second part is just the strong working knowledge uh, of our local officers and with working with the Catholic charity staff of knowing someone and, and their past and if they were uh, did have any type of disqualifying offenses like that. But also our staff is going to be working if there were any type of criminal behavior that gets reported, especially of any type of a, a sexual nature that we would immediately investigate that and take uh, make any arrests for any type of criminal behavior that may have um, existed. But the most important thing is, is kind of that evaluating that the Catholic Charity staff is gonna be doing, that's gonna be part of the application process. And the Megan's Law process is very easy to identify those names and be able to address that before it ever becomes a problem. Okay, our next speaker is Tracy, followed by Bruce. Tracy, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, you have the floor. Tracy, are you there? You look to be unmuted, but uh, we don't hear you. You can take the next speaker and then return and see if uh, the audio will work. Okay. Uh, Bruce, you are the next speaker. If you could go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I'm Bruce. I'm a long-term uh, RVer, so a couple of concerns on this. Is there going to be a portable dump truck where they will be able to hook up to the RVs or have the RVs have a tank and they can suck it out for the black and the gray water? The other thing is you're going to be running on batteries or the truck or um, the RV or truck that tows the trailer is going to have to run to generate those batteries. Uh, that's going to be a lot of smog and just a lot of noise and everything else. Is there going to be electrical hookups for these people that they can just run off the electricity and be quiet and then that way they'll be fine? Um, and then the third thing is um, gas. In other words, propane for the heating of the, of the actual RV. Is there going to be facilities for them or they just have to run and, you know, go and get and, and all that? Um, those are my three main concerns other than obviously trash and all that and the extra traffic and all that of uh, you've already um, put the kibosh on that with the um, no visiting and all that. But that's my main concern and, you know, uh, the RVs, which you say is going to be in good condition. So those three things would help both the city and also the people in the RV because some, you know, they want to wash their dishes or whatever and be able to cook in the RV and kind of be semi-normal and that would help them a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I really appreciate your insight as somebody who um, has experience with RVs and um, 
these are all things that we're thinking through um, and trying to figure out before we get the program up and running. So your question about um, is there going to be an option or a service for uh, dumping of um, black and gray water tanks? Um, if the if the RV has uh, working facilities, then um, I know Catholic Charities is uh, in the process of identifying vendors that can provide that service. Otherwise, um, we will have portable toilets and hand washing stations um, and uh, potable water on the site for participants. And then a generator, uh, that's an issue that's been raised with the group. And so we're not, this is not an RV park. There will not be full hookups. Um, we, were, we will have to be establishing some rules around um, generator use so that we can avoid some of the issues that you just raised. And then uh, for propane, again, if they have, you know, working facilities, uh, um, you know, and, and propane tanks that are safe for use, then that would be another um, service that we would be working with Catholic Charities to try and provide to uh, people that are, that are in our program. Okay, thank you. Um, our next speaker, we're going to try Tracy again, followed by Madonna Feather. Um, Tracy, go ahead and unmute yourself. I did. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. So my name is Tracy Trezos, and I live in the Marlowe Estate Homeowners Association area, which is Marlowe, Little River, Albion, Navarro area. So I just have kind of a, a, um, a comment or a concern or an, an annoyance. Um, I feel like I'm surrounded um, by low income um, or there's been pilots of our area um, that we had the training station, the fire training station. They had um, homeless there at one point. They had people at Finley at one point. They're building the uh, low income slash other mixed use um, at the city water there on West College. On Jennings, they have low income um, seniors as well as low income housing right over there by the Marlowe Safeway. And I just feel like we're over inundated um, our area. And I, um, I've heard the comments about how long it's going to be. I just wished it wasn't in our area to start because I feel like we've just had an over inundation. That's probably not even a real word, but whatever, um, of low income, uh, homelessness. Um, and I feel really bad for the, for the county, for all the homelessness people and um, whether they're in tents or, or trailers and RVs or whatever. So it's just a comment. And I would like you to look in your area where you guys live and tell me how many people are low income or homeless in your area to fear, feel my frustration. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy, for your comments. Our next speaker is Madonna Feather, followed by James Larkin. Madonna Feather, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, uh, my name is Madonna Feather Cruz. I'm a project director, Native American liaison and outreach coordinator for Disability Services and Legal Center. Um, downtown at 521 Mendocino Avenue. And we serve over 2000 um, low income uh, persons with disabilities. And I'm just here tonight to express um, our support and our gratitude uh, for this pilot uh, project. And um, many of my questions were answered tonight. Um, one, uh, one question not answered. Um, so for me to come and do outreach um, at the site, um, would that be something I can do? And then if it is, would I email the homeless at centerofthecity.org? And then my other question, um, it was in the next steps, uh, hiring would be January through February of 22. Um, would that be part-time jobs or part-time and full-time? And would that be listed under Catholic Charities website or uh, City of Santa Rosa's website. Um, and again, um, thank you and uh, Disability Services and Legal Center definitely support uh, everything you guys are doing to house our low income people. And just a side note, um, my first apartment that I got when I was 18 years old was um, a two bedroom, two bathroom uh, for $500. And uh, nowhere in the county can I see that. So 
uh, you know, I always, I always think back and uh, they, can't, they can't afford to live. And uh, many, many of my clients can't afford to live here. Um, and that's why they are homeless or they're sleeping on a couch. Um, so again, my gratitude. And if I could have those two questions answered, that would be great. And thank you so much. Yeah, I can, um, I can start out. Um, I think there's mostly operational ones. So the first one is outreach at the site. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we are kind of as part of our COVID-19 safety protocols, we are limiting outside visitors. However, we do have uh, allow for third party service providers to come on site as long as they're willing to comply with our safety protocols to keep the site safe. So we can we can definitely partner on it. I know we work with Disability Service and Legal Center a tremendous amount with a lot of our different shared uh, participants. So we would welcome that continued partnership at this program. I'll put my contact information in the chat box and people can uh, reach out to me in that way and I can get you to the right person, get you to our program manager and our assistant director to help follow up with that. Um, in terms of hiring, those uh, positions are listed on Cat the Charities website. Uh, we're doing the hiring for this on behalf of the city as our operator. Uh, we're looking for all sorts of things, not only for safe parking, but uh, we're looking at for uh, staff at all of our existing homeless service programs. Uh, we have opportunities for both full-time and part-time, uh, both in the area of operations to help with operating of our sites. Also in the areas of case management, we have our housing navigation team, our housing stabilization team, and our housing location team, all of which will be working with the participants at this site. So I will put my contact information and I will put our website in the chat box. So if you are interested and can help spread the word, we wanna uh, get uh, the best individuals who are really passionate about uh, what we're trying to accomplish here and working with this population, we'd love to get them hired. So thank you for both of those questions. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is James Larkin, followed by Shirley and Bob Cheel. And James Larkin, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself. You have the floor. Okay, I should be, you're receiving me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm calling because uh, we have a, a residence on uh, Valley Vista 3, which is right across Santa Rosa Creek from where you're proposing to put this RV parking facility. I have two questions. Uh, number one, uh, have the city attorneys uh, looked at uh, liability uh, issues containing, pertaining to lawsuits for falls and slips and whatever else might be brought against the city or for providing this, like any landlord would have to be concerned about? And a second question is, uh, you're, we're talking about $4.3 million to fund this thing. I was just reading today that the Governor Newsom is uh, proposing $14 billion to fund the same thing that you're attempting to do here throughout the state. Is there a linkage between what you're doing or is this a totally autonomous burden on the city of Santa Rosa and the Santa Rosa Police Department to enforce any legal issues that, that happen there? And, Police departments have been defunded across this country, unfortunately. And so uh, I'm wondering, uh, where is this connection with the Governor Newsom and his proposed $14 billion funding? Thank you. Thank you, James. I'll take the liability um, question. I you know, I work in the city manager's office. I'm not representing the city attorney's office, but I can say that we're working very closely um, across the city with all of our departments and both our city attorney and risk management have been in, involved in discussions uh, about this program um, and taking into consideration some of the issues that you just raised. So thank you for that. Um, government funding um, and gov uh, I said Governor Newsom's uh, uh, funding that's coming down from the state to help with homelessness. Um, I can say for this particular program, we're not using any state funding, it's city funding, and then the county um, is uh, also contributing money for the program, but we are pursuing every opportunity um, that becomes available for, for funding outside of, of the city of Santa Rosa. Um, Claire, do you want to touch briefly on, on some of that 
because I know we're um, we're looking at a number of programs. Yeah, thank you. Um, we are not going to um, turn away any state dollars, right? So City of Santa Rosa cannot fund these programs alone. Um, this is a pilot program. Um, one of the things that state funding looks for is they look for um, especially um, proven programs that they can support uh, for longer term. So this is kind of the first step to be quite eligible for state funding for something like this um, is to go ahead and, and, and put in your investment um, and, and, and test to see if this is actually a path to housing, which is really um, also the strategy of the state. So we are also leveraging um, all the activities from all the other jurisdictions in the county um, and the county itself. Uh, we, we need to do it together. Um, it's ex extremely expensive ventures to address this issue. And there's a, we have to address it in a lot of different ways because the, it's a complex issue. So we, we will continue to research and advocate for additional state funding, but this is one of the first steps is testing these new ideas. Um, and so we will learn a lot from this and uh, we'll, we'll look to seek additional funding just like other jurisdictions. Thank you. It looks like our last hand raised is Shirley and Bob Cheel. Shirley and Bob, go ahead and unmute yourself. You have the floor. Hi, everybody. Hey, in this case, it's Bob Cheel. Um, I want to say thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Obviously, a lot of hard work is going into it, has gone into it. And I appreciate what you just said about, sounds like you're really trying to think outside the box on how to, how to put together a successful program. So I really hope for the um, good success here. I got one question for you it is more of a legal type question. And that is if we're doing 20, if you're doing a 24 hour program and I suppose a person might think that they're living on the site, um, was there a concern or have you ever been concerned about the question of, are you creating a landlord tenant relationship here where they have certain tenant rights? Um, what can you say about that question? Um, that's all I've got here today, but thank you. I appreciate your work. I can try to take it from our experience as an operator. Uh, so we operate uh, what we call either emergency shelter or interim housing uh, programs. And this is gonna be falling into that category. In that case, it is not considered long-term housing. And so the landlord tenant relationship is different. Now we have a program operator, program participant agreement, and that we definitely wanna honor people on both on uh, parties on both sides. We actually, when people come into our programs, we have a set of um, uh, of responsibilities that we also we we hold ourselves accountable with staff. We put it in writing of what we will do for the participants and what we ask the participants to do to be while they're in the program. It's a mutual agreement and that holds uh, responsibility on both sides of the of the agreement to make sure we're both upholding our ends of the deal. Um, but in this case, this would not qualify in, um, in any sense of a, of a permanent housing. It doesn't meet the definition. And so that's where the landlord tenant component comes in. Um, and that's similar to our other shelters and other housing interim housing programs that we have operated. Thanks, Jenny Lynn. So, uh, Bob, that's an excellent question. I know that it's been raised with all these other things that have come up that we're trying to think through. and. In the moment right now, I cannot remember what, um, you know, what resolution we came to with that um, in our conversations with other staff in the city attorney's office. So um, I've been taking notes of the questions and the comments we're receiving this evening. I'm going, I made note of that one and I'm going to follow up on that one. Um, I might even have an answer tonight before we wrap up. If not, I will I'll, um, respond to you and I'll be sure and update our FAQ. Um, with that information. So we have more hands. Um, Claire, just want to check in with you if you want to continue on with the live at this point, or would do you feel like you want to switch to Q&A um, and then back to the live? I'd like to uh, do the live comments first, and then okay. I have been watching the, uh, the chat and the Q&A, um, so I'll continue to look at that, see if there's questions that were not verbalized, but if we can get to live comments first, that'd be great. Okay, great, thank you. So our next speaker uh, is Brad Childs, followed by Gregory Fearon, 
Brad, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Hi, good evening, folks. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in this in, entire program um, because I personally have worked with low-income housing and uh, transitional housing for people for 15 years. And I, I know from my own experience, some things that have happened um, which prompt me to ask you these questions. Uh, first of all, I wanted to ask, uh, is, are all of the services combined for this program, are they free to the participants? That was one question. The second one is, are, are the participants original residents? Are they residents of Sonoma County or former residents that you're helping? Uh, the third question is uh, animals, dogs in, in particular. Um, would you be making certain that you said you, you want to make sure that the animals are healthy? Uh, would they be vaccinated and licensed as well? Um, and also, uh, I guess my final question is, with the number of participants possibly being 50, are they assigned a parking space? So if they leave the facility and they come back later, uh, do they still have their space available to them? Or is this going to be a revolving thing for um, you know, different people during the day, during the night, or is it just a set 50? Uh, I think that's about, that's about all I have. Thank you. Thank you. I can um, tell you I'm going to take some of them and then follow up on yeah, the area. <laughs> I'll, I'll start with a couple of them. And thank you, Brad. Um, in terms of are the services free? Yes, they're free. Uh, the program certainly isn't free. Um, I talked about you know our, our budget and contract with Catholic Charities, but the services are free for the participants. In terms of residents of Sonoma County, we're going to be um, focusing and targeting on encampments in Santa Rosa. Uh, and then Jenny Lynn, if you want to talk about, you know, your requirements around uh, animals and service, or should say pets and service animals, and then also um, how you, uh, you know, treat um, individuals that leave a program and, and, and return in terms of reserving your space. Yeah, and I'll just add to the, you know, just some data around individuals experiencing homelessness in Sonoma County. So 88% of people experiencing homelessness in Sonoma County lived in Sonoma County when they became homeless. And of that, 64% lived here for 10 years or more. So a majority of the people we're working with are people who were living in Sonoma County when they became homeless. So they are our kind of community members. I'll also mention that our outreach team is very well versed with those who are living here and have been working with so many of these people for so many years and really has an intimate knowledge of their needs and how we can help them and where they have been coming from. And that also comes out of some of the work we do alongside of the city on some of the encampment uh, efforts as well. So that there is a, a good knowledge about where people's histories and we'll continue to work with it to engage people as we uh, as the needs arise and as we encounter new individuals in our community. Um, I do want to just to kind of add a couple of areas. So we, uh, we will be allowing pets and by pets, we mean dogs. That is a uh, kind of our current policy and this majority of the need among the unsheltered population. Um, I, I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the reason we do that is one, uh, we're trying to lower as many barriers as possible for people to come into entry and, um, we found that by not allowing them to come in with their animals, people would choose to live outside rather than leave their animal. And so we wanted to be able to engage them into the program and allow that as an option. Uh, with uh, our kind of pet policy, we do ask that um, any of the dogs are spayed or neutered and we can help provide that service. And other than that, that's not necessarily, you know, we work with them to get their licensing and their vaccinations and everything for the end of and the animal care for the dog. And we treat the dog or the pet in this case, uh, similar to what as a participant, making sure they have food and access to care similar to the individual or the owner. 
Um, again, uh, along the lines of uh, the uh, behavior, we do have a behavior-based program. And so if there is a situation that makes it unsafe for the animal to continue to stay or the owner to continue to stay, then we do deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and then with regards to the assigned parking space, we will be assigning individuals parking spaces so they will have their spot that they can come back to. Uh, part of that is for consistency for the individual and part of it is because we have a, a tight space and we want to, you know, we'll have a certain number of RVs that'll be allowed and a certain number of vehicles and we want to make sure to fit as uh, much as we can in while still holding the safety standards that we've set for ourselves and uh, so they will have an assigned place that they can come back to when they leave for the day to access um, services or if they leave for the day to go to work and so on and so forth. I will say a lot of the people when we ran this safe parking program in the past, uh, a lot of the individuals worked and they left for work for the day and they came back or they worked an overnight shift and they needed a place to sleep during the day. Uh, that, that is a lot of who we saw in the previous uh, uh, versions of this program and we expect to see more of that here. Hopefully I, I caught everything. Let me know if I didn't. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Gregory Firon, followed by Madonna Feather. Gregory, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you very much. I want to, first of all, um, thank the city of Santa Rosa for uh, taking the lead in um, uh, stimulating the uh, RFP and the process of making a selection. Um, an agency I'm on the board of um, competed for the contract to be able to do this service. Uh, we're currently opening one in Sebastopol, uh, much smaller. Uh, and I just want to thank uh, Jenny Lynn for uh, competing against us and winning. She has, uh, uh, as it turned out, and we probably could have predicted, far more experience, far more capability, and um, it, you know, an excellent proposal that we hope to partner with, uh, because as someone said earlier, this is not something that any one agency can do by themselves. This is something that all of us have to work together because we're gonna be learning some of the same things and sharing the same sort of lessons and, and uh, dealing somewhat with the same clients. So this is, a, this is a partnership that Santa Rosa and Sebastopol at least are taking a bold move into and I just wanna appreciate that. Um, we're, we're very excited about it. And, um, so, and it sounds like I, I got in on this late because I had a, an ARPA zoom before this from five to six, but it sounds like you've gotten some excellent questions. Some of the same questions we got over in Sebastopol. Uh, and so, like I said, we're all learning and we're all doing, and I think we have every, um, expectation of success. Thank you, Gregory. Our next speaker is Madonna Feather. Uh, Madonna Feather, go ahead and um, uh, unmute yourself. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, so I just wanted to comment, um, I do live around the corner from Finley and um, Finley is my neighborhood park where I, I walk through every day. Um, and um, I am not one of the those persons who, um, you know, not in my backyard. Um, I want to just say that there was not one single problem um, during the homeless encampment with the tents um, early on in COVID. Um, and I have an 18-year-old daughter, so neither her or I uh, ever had any um, interaction that was inappropriate, disrespectful, um, or anything, uh, you know, bad um, in that area. So I just wanted to um, say that as well. And then I have to jump off. I will put my email in there. Um, so you can hopefully put me in touch with that um, person. Okay. Um, I thank you guys again, and you guys have a, a nice night. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Thomas followed by Jeff and Sherry. Thomas, go ahead and unmute yourself. You have the floor. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Hi, great. Uh, I just wanted to respond to the gentleman's question uh, about tenant rights. I think it was Bob Chiel, um asked about tenant rights. Uh, uh, shelter housing and the temporary housing does not arise to the level of tenant rights, uh, according to state law. Um, uh, within the California code. Um, 
I was thinking and hoping that you would be offering electricity to the safe parkers. It's very inexpensive. And one thing we found, I used to buy and get um, uh, um, 12 volt replacement bulbs that are very low, um, the, you know, they're LED bulbs and you put them in and then they use almost no electricity at all. Even the batteries uh, of the vehicles can last a much longer time and the, the, these uh, LED bulbs are really, really cheap. And, and ultimately you're looking at 20 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, it's, it's possible to run these for, you know, uh, my goodness, um, maybe two, three kilowatt hours a day, maybe a dollar a day, uh, you know, for, for each of these. So it's, uh, and probably less, it's a lot cheaper than running generators and anything like that's a lot safer and better for the people. Um, if you were to do that, um, I'm hoping that the city can uh, have additional safe parking. I'd like to talk to Kelly and the city about that. Um, and I also wanted to point out to Captain Cregan and thank him for his diligence and everything on, on all of these. Uh, there was the county which had the safe parking site uh, now some number of years ago on the county. First it was at the fairgrounds and then it was moved over to the county uh, campus as it's called. And I happened to be, I had arranged for the food to be uh, acquired at Oliver's and then delivered to, to the safe parking. I happened to be there in the evening and one of the police officers drove up and said, you can't be parked here to the, everyone who was parked there. And uh, you know, this is, this is county property and you can't park here. And we said it's uh, safe parking. This is a safe parking facility made available by the county on the county's property. And he said, I don't care about that. You can't park here. This is closed. This is a facility closed. And I said, well, wait a minute. Look here. These, every one of these people has a safe parking pass. They have a safe parking permit from Catholic Charities. And, and finally, eventually, the guy kind of drove away. The point is, is that not all the officers are aware of the programs that the city has. And it would be really great if you could communicate to them that there is this thing. Now I know this is public, you know, this is a public meeting and it's a public notice of meeting and those kind of things. But again, they're not always aware and it's kind of problematic when somebody's in the middle of their meal, in the evening meal, and they're just getting ready to go to bed and up drives a police officer and says, all oh, y'all got to get out of this parking lot because there's no parking here. And it's, it's very shocking, especially ordered by, by a police officer who believes he's making a lawful order. So I would ask you to please be careful to notify everyone about the specifics and, and Kelly as well, if you can. You know, that wasn't the county's project, was not your guy's project. And so it wasn't your responsibility, but the city police were policing it and that did have a problem. So I would just mention that. And, and thank you all for your, for your effort. It's, I'm, I'm so glad there's a safe parking uh, program coming and look for more. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Thomas, for your comments. Thomas, right. from the police department's perspective on that, I'm, I'm actually sending out a department-wide email tonight that's going to have the frequently asked questions, it's going to have the PowerPoint from tonight, and we'll be following up with our briefings to make sure that our staff members, and that's an unfortunate incident, the officer was obviously should have been aware of that. So we'll make sure our record staff or dispatchers are all be aware of this program. And, um, and I don't think you'll see a repeat performance of that. Okay, our next speaker, Jeff and Sherry. Uh, Jeff and Sherry, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And sorry if you guys all heard my timer, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, no worries. Um, being homeless, what, what, what are the homeless going to do until the middle of February, March? Um, as far as finding a place to stay or a hotel for homeless? I don't know. Did you hear me? 
We did, so Jeff. We, thank you. We were, I just didn't know if you had further questions or comments. I can't think of any at the moment. I mean, um, I think the RV parking was covered. Um, I was trying to find a, uh, RV spaces that would fit in the budget because being homeless and disabled makes it difficult. Jen, do you, do you want to start with what services are currently available? Yeah, I can mention, you know, we, we want to get this program up and running as quickly as we can. Obviously, this has been a a huge need for a long time and um, and the, especially for people living in their vehicles. Uh, we certainly understand that uh, sometimes that is a preferred alternative to uh, other uh, forms of shelter. And so that's what's so exciting about this project project is to give people that alternative option for those that are living in their vehicles. Uh, unfortunately, it does take some ramp up time to get a site prepared, especially for something at this magnitude. Um, and so we're trying to go as quickly as we can, but in the interim, we do still have our uh, existing shelter operations. We also have uh, partner operations throughout the city and the county. Uh, other organizations like Rebel Gospel Mission, Community Action Partnership, uh, Committee on the Shelter List, and so many more that we uh, work with day in and day out on this issue. Uh, if somebody is trying to access not even just a Catholic Charities uh, shelter, but any shelter in the county, they can call our host hotline. I did put it in the chat box. I can do it as uh, put it in there again to make sure people have access as the chat has been continued ongoing. Um, and they can get access not only to, uh, again, our existing services, but also other shelters in the community as well. It is a tough time right now. We do have some reduced shelter capacity given what's going on with COVID-19 uh, and these extra safety protocols we have to take into place, but we are also very uh, creative and when individuals need access, we do everything we can to get them uh, the needs that to get the needs met that they have. Um, so it's a, a lot of different things. Um, we heard from Disability Service and Legal Center that they're a great partner as well. So um, we can uh, definitely work to get people access and I'll put the host hotline in the uh, chat box uh, right now. And Jeff, I want to thank you and just acknowledge that we we know that the need is great and that there aren't um, enough options out there for people who are homeless right now. So uh, just want just want to take a second to acknowledge that. And um, we are trying to provide more options for this program, but recognize it's it's not enough. So thank you. Okay, I do not see any more hands. Oh, um, wait, he, I think he has a follow up. Let's, let me go ahead and go ahead and unmute Jeff. Yeah, I was wondering um, how soon would I be able to apply to get on the list for the, uh, the safe parking program? Yeah, great question. We, we're, we're able to take individuals' interest right now. Uh, again, you can call that host hotline number. Uh, you can also directly contact me and I can make sure to get you to the right person as well. My contact information is in the chat and I'll update it again here. Um, so yes, multiple ways to get, uh, get going on that. And as soon as uh, we have the site up and running, we hope to fill it as quickly as we can and as safely as we can to make sure to meet this need in the community. Okay, I don't see any more hands um, raised. So, Clara, would you like me to read the Q&A or do you have that kind of handled on your end? Yes, um, thank you. <clears throat> they might have already been um, answered, but I'm going to repeat the questions that I read in the Q&A um, just to make sure. So there, there's actually not that many. There was three. Um, I'll just go one by one. Um, two came from one commenter. Uh, who will qualify when the space when the who will qualify for a space when the lot is full? So qualify when it's full. So who will qualify when I when, who will qualify for a space when the lot is full? So how how will people help? Is there who gets to who gets to come in if there if two people come at the same time? 
Yeah, great question. Um, so we'll we'll be filling the, you know, we haven't come up with a total transition plan of how many we'll accept like in a week. You know, we can't fill 50 spots one night. As much as we'll try, we'll do as many as we can, but obviously that's a lot to do in one day when you're just starting operations. So we will be kind of ramping up to the full 50 um, allotment. Uh, in the meantime, what we have done in the past is Right. We work with the city's uh, heat team to see where the greatest need is in the community and which individuals have the greatest need. One of the things that's important to us is to make sure we're um, getting individuals, not just who can best self-advocate or navigate the system, but the people who need the spaces the most. So we do go and look at an individual's vulnerability and their uh, need for access to care to survive and stay alive. That is something that is uh, always built into our screening protocol. So it will likely be a part of that here as well. Um, and I think if, you know, we're, we're, we're going to learn about this program and see what the demand is. And if the demand far outweighs the uh, capacity we have, that'll be further conversation about what, how we want to continue to partner or do more of these in the future. Great, thank you. Second question I read was um, from the same uh, author was, uh, won't this encourage people from out of the area to come to Santa Rosa and use this service? And uh, I'll just preface um, perhaps the further responses. Um, as we discussed, we're not doing this alone. We can't do this alone. We don't want to do this alone. Um, so we're doing our part. And as you saw from the numbers in the early slides, um, we have a big part. Uh, and so we're going to do our part. We're going to test this as an option. Um, and uh, and learn from it. Um, and then luckily we've had good communication with the county and other jurisdictions and they're gonna do the same. So we are gonna do it together. It's not just gonna be um, the only facility like this. I don't know if others on the panel wanna add to that. Yeah, I'll just kind of, you know, definitely agree with that. Um, my, you know, my hope is to see these kind of diverse services across the county and not just in the city or not just operated by one provider and see it all over um, and providing more diverse options and choice options for people that are all linked to the long term housing location process that we're all committed to doing, which is really where we're going to start ending homelessness. Um, I'll also just reiterate some of the data I, sh I shared earlier is that according to the, the data we get, um, which is conducted on a pretty regular basis, you know, 88% of the people who are experiencing homelessness in Sonoma County lived in Sonoma County when they became homeless and 64% lived here for 10 years or more. So these are our neighbors. These are our community members for the most part. These individuals are in need here in Sonoma County. They lived in Sonoma County when the need arose. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that, and that's a whole nother discussion about what we can have, how our community has, um, you know, so many individuals that are living here that have become homeless, but for the most part, these are our, our, our members and, uh, and, our, and our, our neighbors, so it's important we do what we can to take care of them and acknowledge the complexity of the issue. Great, and then the last question that came up through the um... Q&A, uh, so I guess the last question of the night. Uh, how many participants are we looking at? I know we talked about up to 50 spaces. I'm not sure if it was clarified about um, potential number of participants. So it's up to 50, uh, but that really depends on, and good question, thank you. It really depends on the ratio of large vehicles or RVs to small vehicles. And so, um, and you know, oftentimes there are more. There's more than one individual living in a vehicle or RV. So we're doing our best to try and meet council's direction to provide up to up to 50 space spaces, while also making sure that the occupancy um, works for you know the the, the site setup, um, overall program design, and trying to minimize any impacts to. Uh, you know, employees that are working out of facilities there, um, using the parking lot and the surrounding community. So I don't have, you know, a maximum occupancy at this point in time. You can't say it's not going to be more than 75. Um, but I will say that we're trying to keep it below the 50 spaces. And it's likely going to be, I mean, 50 parking spots, it's likely going to be fewer than that, depending on the ratio of the, the mix of RVs and vehicles, but you know, we will be looking at that closely just to make sure that 
Um, we're keeping it to a manageable size um, while uh, you know, mitigating potential impacts. I was just seeing if there's any additional questions. All right. All right. Well, great job, panel, and great job, attendees. You uh, you had some excellent questions, and uh, we know you'll still have more. So again, um, this is a continued conversation. We're going to learn about this together. Um, you can see how proactive we're trying to be um, and really address it holistically. Um, so I want to thank all the attendees. I want to thank um, the staff that are, have put so much work into this um, and into this meeting to pre be prepared to answer your questions. I want to thank Mayor Rogers for joining us, Council Member Swellhelm, and also Council Member uh, Rogers. Um, and with that, I will leave it to the mayor to close out our, our community meeting tonight. No, and I'll be really brief. And I want to thank everybody for your thoughtful questions. Uh, it, it does take a village. Uh, it's going to take all of us working together, all of our departments, from our nonprofit partners who are plugging in to our community engagement department that'll be working with the neighborhoods as well uh, to make sure that your voices are heard. I, I would really encourage you to stay involved on the conversation. And there's been a number of different uh, avenues that have been provided, emails, uh, phone numbers uh, for SRPD, for our service provider for the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, my cell phone number is available on the city's website, and I know that other council members, Council Member Schwedelm and, and Rogers in particular, are very accessible as well. So please reach out if you see something that isn't working or if you have a suggestion on how we can do this better. This is a pilot pro project that is aimed at getting folks off the streets ultimately and ending homelessness for them, uh, and it will take all of us working together. So thank you for taking the time tonight. Thank you to our staff. Uh, for developing the project and just let us know uh, as we move forward this will continue to to be uh, updating the public as well all right thanks everyone and have a wonderful evening thank you